And so a wonderful way to celebrate International Women's Day by learning how women are changing the face of brain research from basic science to advocacy. So you want to think about which biological differences are due to gender, the social, and which biological differences are due to sex, the biological. And that leads to more rigorous science. Memory in women who've had their ovaries removed before natural menopause. So that's before the age of 50. Why are we doing that? Because there's some epidemiological large population studies showing that women who have their ovaries removed prior to natural menopause have higher all causes of death, but as well, they have higher incidence of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And also, we're hoping that this work will be encouraging to, for example, biophysicists to invent other ways of imaging the ovaries so the ovaries don't need to be removed and we could follow them over time. Autism is four times as likely in boys as it is in girls. ADHD, attention deficit disorder, is three times as likely in boys as in girls. Depression and other anxiety related disorders are three times as likely in women as in men or girls than in boys. These are striking, striking differences, not just subtle effects, but twice as likely, three times as likely, four times as likely in one sex than in the other, or one gender than in the other. So if we want to understand mental health disorders, we want to understand diseases of the brain, we really have to understand why are they so different between men and women. And there's a series of scientists, including some here at SickKids with Mike Salter's group, as well as Jeff Mogul over at McGill, who have spent years and years beginning to work out the mechanism of how is chronic pain actually signaled in the brain? And what might be, if we understand the mechanism of how chronic pain works, what might we do to be able to relieve it, treat it, whether with pharmacology or with other techniques? But now imagine that you've just stuck with the male mouse model initially. You found the signaling pathway, you can begin to manipulate it with pharmacology, you can create drugs for it, you can treat it. And even if you did that perfectly, went all the way to the end, would only be successful in about a third of all the patients you would see in the clinic. So this is really where a classic case of where having to use both males and females will begin to illustrate where the differences arise in some of these diseases and how we can treat them. And if you do it in one sex only, you would be making a mistake. I've always really thought about diversity as a byproduct of creating an open and respectful atmosphere and environment rather than an agenda. The reason I say this is because I think there are a lot of organizations right now that really look at diversity as almost like a checkbox that we need to tick off. Um, and so, you know, I really want to say that there's really no point to introducing, you know, 50% cabinets and, um, you know, offering scholarships to entice minorities if they're just going to be disempowered when they enter our organizations. So I do want to share that when we first started as a company, I made everyone on the team think about the values, their own personal values, and what they wanted to bring into the company. And we identified values such as transparency, uh, such as equal opportunity for everyone, as well as openness to change. And so I really urge everybody in this audience today to go think about you know, what kinds of values do you have in your team? Have you talked about what your values are? Because really, along with talking about empowerment, we also need to talk about stopping disempowerment. And I think that's ultimately what's going to lead to an increased diversity in all these fields that currently are in dire need of more diversity. So I think what I've been able to do is take my experience as a patient and in a limbo of waiting and waiting for the right treatment and sort of translate it in a way that's meaningful about what it means to be a patient and what we should be doing. And with the vantage point that says, I was once a healthcare executive. I sat at those tables where we worked on metrics. How many people come into ER? How fast do they get out? When do they get a bed? Will we see them again? And then I put on my blue hospital gown, which is democratic and universal, and honestly, the only metric that mattered was treat me like a person. You know, even, um, even as an entrepreneur, somebody needs to take an interest in your professional success. Somebody needs to give you the funding. Somebody needs to take that, that chance on you and, and um, be your voice and say to other investors, this is a good investment to make, right? Or in the corporate organization uh, landscape, they're at that table where promotions are being discussed or job opportunities, and they say, 
you know, Marcia's uh, terrific, we should put her in that role, for example. Um, and that's what, that's what sponsorship is. Uh, so, so a lot of what, uh, what I do when talking to people is talk to them about how to cultivate uh, that sponsorship because it's around building relationships, um, people seeing you in action and, and working with those people, and then um, being open about what your aspirations are. Uh, and when you find that connection, uh, it, asking for the help, um, asking for the role, and letting that person uh, know about your interests so that they can be your voice at the table.